Okay. Hey, Ellie. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Pete. How's it going? It is absolutely fantastic. I am absolutely fantastic. I'm so happy to see you today. And I'm really excited to talk about, you know, kind of current initiatives that you guys are undertaking over there at the Land of Sales Loft. Um, but before we get started on that, um, hey, everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and at this uh, Sales Excellence Summit by Modern Sales Pros. I'm super pumped to have an amazing product leader here from revenue, a leading revenue technology company to kind of talk with us about the current kind of state, technological state of modern sales and some kind of really interesting key initiatives that they've been up to. Um, but before we get started on that, for folks who don't know, my name is Pete Kazanji. It's awesome to see you. Um, I'm one of the founders of Atrium. We make sales performance management software that helps organizations improve rep attainment through more effective management, primarily you know, through data-driven management. But that's what that's what I do. That's my day job. Um, my night job, as it were, is one of the co-founders of uh, Modern Sales Pros, which you guys are all members of. Um, but I'm really excited to have Ellie here today as one of the things that I am so nice about my, my night job, I suppose, is I get to hang out with revenue leaders and also revenue product leaders who are doing kind of cutting edge things. So Ellie, maybe you can kind of share with the audience here a little bit about what you spend your time doing and, and kind of maybe just like a little bit about your background so people can be suitably impressed. What do you think? Oh, wow. That's a lot of pressure. Um, well, I can tell you what I do. You got it. Great. Uh, I lead product and engineering at Salesloft, and we are a uh, revenue orchestration platform. We help sellers get to outcomes. And uh, so I spend a lot of time thinking about product plans, product strategy, looking at our practices across the team, just everything you do as, as, as a leader. I talk to customers all the time, talk to analysts, uh, watch what's happening in the market, all of those things. Um, prior to Salesloft, I was at Tableau for about 12 years, where I did something similar, uh, working in product and, uh, and engineering and product marketing for a while. And, um, you know, I am a huge data geek. That is a thing about me. I really love me some data. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons I came to sales law from, from Tableau was because I, uh, I started to really believe that data in a vacuum or in a silo was not helpful. And you know, sales is a profession that needs data deeply. And so I thought putting it into the workflow and in action was super interesting, a hard problem, a valuable problem. And I came over to sales law to work on that. Right. So as as uh, your CRO over there, Steve Goldberg, is wont to say, um, we are not here to admire a problem. Right. Yeah. And so you need to make things actionable. Right. This is something that uh, hopefully this isn't offending you right now, Ellie, with your, uh, you know, talent. No, actually, I, I love it. I, I love it because dashboards. Yeah. I mean, you know, the dashboards are great, but one of the problems with the dashboard is you can sit there looking at it all day and then what do you do, right? What I mean, next? it's so fantastic, next? but yeah. And, and even with certain roles, I mean, we're talking, we're talking to, to sellers here. You probably don't want to send an entire sales team to a dashboard and say, think about what you might do, right? You want to go shopping. Yeah, please. Yeah, please, please go shopping. Please hours, read the deals. Analyzing data. It's not, it's not what a seller wants to do. It's not what you no. usually hire them to do. So when it comes to data, I think it's our responsibility as technologists to find help find the insights, which means, you know, make something change and then put it into action in a way that people can actually use it. Awesome. And I think we're going to talk about some of the kind of key enabling technologies there, because I feel that we are kindred spirits in that regard. Um, I am also a data geek. Um, I, I don't have my sales nerd hoodie on right now, but we definitely have sent out like, you know, thousands of those to our uh, to our customers here at Atrium. But I think at the end of the day, what we're seeking to do is not is something that's not dissimilar, which is to help, in our case, managers, leaders, also reps, um, you know, better manage themselves and drive better performance um, through through the better application of data. And so usually what that kind of comes down to is like synthesis of an insight, recommendation mm -hmm. of an action, and then the ability to execute on that action, right? So there's a kind of like That's a value awesome. chain there. And, and so, you know, we kind of come at that through the lens of the manager, right? Helping people manage more effectively. Um, and, and sales loft historically is kind of focused on that from a seller standpoint, starting with the SDR, moving on to kind of like other revenue, um, revenue humans as, as well. And I think probably the key enabling technology that has really helped help with this um, is like large language model AI. And, and I think that this is something that I know that has um, that, 
that sales loft has done a bunch about that's like kind of atrium's like little sales coach we went from our our regular fox to like our our kind of ai fox there uh, like about about nine months ago he, um, I like, I like he is by the way also ai generated right not not using a large language model using a diffusion model but yeah. uh you know taking this guy and then making him look more robotic in in alignment with our sales coach narrative but i think i want to talk about sales loft here um when you guys think about how large language model AI and AI can potentially impact, um, you know, sales and marketing now because of some of the recent moves that you guys have been making in the market. Um, you know, how has sales law been thinking about that? Like as, as it can kind of like simplify and improve performance of, of sellers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, LLMs have been transformative. I do want to say that there is a lot of different kinds of, uh, machine, machine learning models, other things that, um, uh, that can be really helpful for sellers and even just uh, building integrated workflows really can be can be helpful. But in the large language model realm, um, it has been transformative. We shipped a couple of capabilities just as soon as these came out and have been continuing to work, work through that. What, when I think about what a seller does, especially today, there's so much volume. Right. There's there's what a buyer is doing out there in the world. There's what, what you're doing with the buyer. There's conversations, there's emails. And a lot of what large language models can do is help us synthesize, help sellers synthesize, yep. distill. And then you take that synthesis out and then you start to put that into other places so that the sellers have the right context when they're taking action. And so really what you're trying to do is instead of necessarily get um, a summary of one call, right? Like it's, that's kind of helpful, but not that helpful. Yeah, what fine. you might want to do. Yeah. It's, you, you want to look across an entire opportunity, all the stakeholders, all their roles, time-based, maybe different opportunities in the account. And you want to have this holistic view across all communication channels, right? Maybe I sent them an email. Maybe they texted me right at the end of a deal. Maybe we did a bunch of conversations. These are all reasons why you, you might want to pull information out of that and then present it again. Um, and I'll go back to at the point of action because simply knowing all that, again, doesn't really help a seller if you don't get them the ability to take action. Yeah, I, I think that's that's super critical. I think there's a lot of organizations right now that are kind of going from a they're, they're engaging in their own personal crawl, walk, run right. behaviors, right. right? And and we did something similar right when large language models first came out. We we're like, hey, you know, we can do kind of synthesis and recommendation um, of next actions on like an individual metric that was out of that was out of compliance, right? So like, you know, here's this individual seller and, you know, they're they're pacing behind on their customer facing meeting goals, you know, like a single thing, kind of like in isolation, if you will, yeah. um, and then kind of do synthesis and, and recommendation. And so the first step is like turning it into human readable language is actually really important because mm -hmm. like numbers are an abstraction from like, you know, like right. language meaning that like humans are pretty good at. Um, and so if you can turn it into language, then like now all of a sudden you open up the, the audience that can kind of grok it a lot yeah. better. But then even then, if it's a, it's the one thing in isolation, it's not as it's not necessarily as compelling. And this is what like what we saw things really change is when we went from you know synthesis and recommendation predicated on like a single metric, you know, Absolutely. either a goal or whatever that was out of that was out of compliance or maybe ahead of compliance or whatever, to then doing like the holistic view of a seller and maybe like the six things that are going on or the 10 things that are going on with that seller, because that's where it gets more and more complicated for a manager. We call it reading the tea leaves. Like, here yeah. you go. Here's like the flashcards, go ahead and figure it out. And so that's where, you know, managers struggle. And I think yeah, that like absolutely. individual sellers are in the same sort of situation where there's like, there's so many data points associated with this deal and I've got 30 open deals. Oh boy, howdy, how am I going to synthesize this and make sense of it? And then even if I make sense of it, what's the next action that I'm going to take? Yeah, absolutely. And so that and synthesis some, 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 process. Yeah, the synthesis is, is so important. And I think, um, I'm getting excited by what you're saying. You can see, but uh, I think you know there's a lot of things that AI can do, and they'll do things that we didn't imagine. But one very practical application that I think everybody can use is: imagine you had unlimited number of managers with unlimited time. What would they do? Well, they would go through every conversation, right? They would, like you said, they would synthesize. They would read it all. They would. Spend, but there's absolutely no way a manager is going to do that. Now, LLMs can help there. Again, traditional machine learning models can help there. Um, a lot of what great AI does is it it synthesizes, it canvases, it brings in the right information and gets to a point, an insight, a something 
that you need right then. And that's what great, that's, that's what a lot of today's great AI does. Again, I think there's going to be awesome applications in the future, but you can almost use that as a test, right? If my seller had unlimited time, what would they what do? Would they do? Well, they'd yeah. craft, they'd handcraft an email, right? And they'd they'd review every conversation before they went into a meeting. But that's great if you want your seller to sell maybe one opportunity a year, but sellers <laughs> don't have that kind of time. And so that when you start feeling that, you know, if my people had more time, they could do a better job, that's a great place to start looking for AI. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like uh, there's a technology analyst named um uh, Benedict Evans, who yeah. has this like helpful metaphor that he uses that was really instructive to me. Um, I feel that this is in the last like, like maybe three years ago, or four years ago, he kind of like coined this where he said, if you had an infinite number of interns, yeah, right, what would you have them? Would you? And so the funny thing is, is, if you had an infinite number, it was maybe an infinite number of interns like four years ago. And maybe like now it's like actually an infinite number of you know, not interns, but someone actually who has like pretty good subject matter expertise because of like right. the, the way that these large language models have been trained. And so I think the, the, I want to jump in on that, actually. I think, oh, I think please, the thing you can think about is, yeah, it's definitely moving from interns to somebody with capability because I could give you uh, a summary of all the things that happened in an opportunity and you would read it much differently than say my sister, who's an English teacher and a wonderful yeah. English teacher, but has no idea about what's happening in sales, right? Exactly. And so you want your AI to have that sense as well. Find, one of the things that we always ask ourselves when we're building the product is what do you need a human to do? In yeah. selling, you need a human to form relationships, build yeah. trust, guide, strategize. You don't- that Only really, they can do. That only a human can do. Do you really need a human to read back through every single summary of every call or every full transcript? Of course not. Like it's terrible use of time for a human. And so this isn't about, well, get rid of sellers and use AI. It's about your sellers would rather be doing those human things. They're more valuable there. How do you get them doing more of those human things and just give them the rest of the context and information as they need it? Yeah. And so I think one of the things, so if you think, if you, if you start from the, the frame of synthesis across many things, right? Yeah. Distillation across many things is important. Obviously there is a, ever since the advent of the CRM, which is like essentially a shared state database that right. tracks, you know, the arc, the story of a customer, you know, from the point where they're a marketing, you know, suspect to the point where they're actually like a prospect or an SAO to the point where they're actually a customer or what have you. Historically, those have been disparate databases. And so of course, like, you know, marketing and sales gets in fights yeah. over like, yep. you know, what's going on in the marketing automation platform versus what's going on in the CRM and, you know, responsibilities and handoffs and all that sort of stuff. And the same thing happens over here in a post-sale environment. So obviously synthesizing across that, maybe even synthesizing just this first half, Right here, the first two thirds can be very powerful. And I think this is, you know, orchestrating that and making sense of that is something that people aspire to. And I think this is kind of like some of the, the thesis behind some of the strategic moves you guys have been making in the market recently around some technology acquisition and what have you. Maybe you can share a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, we just acquired Drift, which is really a market leader in conversational AI and chat. That's right. And, um, yeah, which is which is very cool. And there's a, there's a couple of, of things to this. One is that if you think about orchestrating seller workflow across the entire buyer journey, we've all got to acknowledge that buyers are doing a lot that is not interacting with the seller. And in yeah. fact, I think, you know, we, we, we've we seen more and more in recent years that buyers come in loaded with things from your website, things from analyst sites, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of what we did last year at Sales Off with Rhythm was provide a way to ingest all those buyer signals from places like G2 or Vidyard right. or what have you into a signal to action engine. And as we were doing that, we talked to customers and they just felt like that was such a valuable piece of the puzzle because they wanted their sellers to know what that buyer yep. had been doing before they came in. Conversational right. AI on a website is just another way to interact, right? What, what a buyer is doing is just another way to interact. So if you can actually start your seller workflow when the buyer journey starts, which is sure. usually the first time they have a first party experience, you can make it much richer. And so that's why we, we, we wanted to bring Drift into the platform so that we could help sellers with a whole buyer journey. What was also great about Drift is that they have been a, a true leader in this idea of conversational AI. Yeah. And that's helping, you know, you, you talked about distilling everything. If you can distill that and put it in a large language model and get back, get it back to the seller, um, either in a, a chat experience where sellers can actually drop into chat and drift and, and chat directly, or an AI can do that to a certain degree. 
you can now take that and you can apply that to email, right? You can redraft an email. It's the same large language model. You've got the same context about the prospect, the opportunity. Big the, bag of words. Right. Our, our product set, whatever it is that you need that seller to know, now you're able to draft that email for them. You're able to help them during a, uh, a live conversation. Potentially, you're, you're able to support them in chat or have chat act alone if a seller's not yet worthwhile there. Because again, we've got to qualify people and spend our time well. You want to spend a human where you where you really need a human. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you, we've seen this quite a bit. Like, so ultimately what you want to do is you want to have a great buyer experience. And, and so yeah. typically what that means is like, don't repeat yourself, which yeah. I guess is a, is a, is a- Don't make the buyer do the work. Yeah, like is a is a computer science kind of like tenant, yeah. and and so like and so if you think about how much we make the the buyer repeat themselves, yeah. um, and every time you make them repeat themselves, they're they're unhappy, or maybe they're not going to repeat something, right? That like it's not their responsibility to carry for the, for this information. Right. So if you like, it's funny we think about this as relates. So we try to do as much like pre discovery or like initiative identification as possible, you know pre-discovery call with the account executive like hey is this organization a good suspect do they have some sort of like you know key performance enhancement initiative that's going on here you know do they perceive that their managers need to raise the level of performance management capability within the organization yep. all those sort of things so the way that you historically do that of course is like hey fill out these forms maybe select these like right. these buttons or whatever which is good because at least you're getting that out of the buyer's mind but then it kind of goes off, like lives in the marketing automation yeah. platform. Maybe it gets shoved into the opportunity object as some sort of like, you know, visual force page or whatever. Or maybe it's just like a bag of words that's in there that the seller doesn't end up looking at. Right. right. So instead, but that's actual information that then sh can show up. So the so the buyer can, the, 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 the rep can say, hey, Ellie, it's so fantastic to see you today. It seems like there's been a big performance shift in your organization post COVID. And so you guys now have an initiative around raising performance levels of the reps. Maybe we can talk, maybe we can use that as a jumping off point versus, hey, Ellie, can you tell me about what keeps you up at night? Which right. obviously is like right. an awful buyer experience. And like the first one, we're like running towards the, the, the goal. Yeah. And the second one, we're like restarting the sales process. Exactly. You, you want to stop. You, you want to not restart the sales process again and again with every single person and and make the the hurdle for the buyer lower and lower. I mean, you shouldn't even be asking the buyer for demographic information, right? That's all available. It's all out there. You can ask them what what problems they have, of course, and, and carry that through. But um, I think what's um, what's great about some of the modern tools that are out is it it lets us again, if we holistically bring things together and, and, and look at it in a workflow, it lets us really do a lot of that. Um, almost grunt work for the seller. So again, they can get back to, let me really understand this buyer. Let me understand if they're the right buyer. Let me guide them through this process versus let me manage a whole bunch of, of information. Yeah. And, and I think that like from a product development standpoint, this isn't super easy because I think a lot of the, a lot of the folks in our audience as like sales operations, revenue operations people, I always like to joke that the revenue operations person is kind of like the product manager of yeah. the sales organization and, so, and and like in a low code environment like where they're trying to use these different like pieces of the stack in order to facilitate a smooth low friction um you know customer journey to enable the seller etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know they're not actually like in the code if you will or like changing uis maybe a little bit little page layout action a little bit of like workflow etc cetera, etc cetera. and so but like synthesizing across all these like just like where all this data is in different kind of places in especially when they're literally in different databases like the map versus the crm versus the sales engagement system ends up being very difficult for the revenue operations person to to kind of facilitate but it's not difficult for uh, sorry it's not easy but it's but you guys can do kind of crazier things there because now you have all these so maybe you can kind of talk about some of the challenges that you guys had to surmount when orchestrating across those like what has historically been disparate parts of of the buyer journey yeah i'll, I'll break it down it's really two things it's action and data right action one of the hard things about sales workflow is that you need to take different kinds of actions. You need to engage with the buyer. You may need to forecast. You may need to review calls and 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 um, do some deal management and so on. So you you actually have to give people places to take action. And going back yep. to your your no dashboards, uh, I, I love that. Most from most the dashboards, you can't take action, right? And we believe it's our job to give a person an action they can take in the minute. I can call you, I can email you, I can write a note in the Sierra, I can do any number of things that help me move forward. So that's that's action. 
And that is really just deeply looking at personas and workflows and what jobs are you doing? We use the jobs to be done framework. And there's a tremendous amount of work in there. The second part of it is data, right? Once you have all this action and I can see that you've called the customer, or you've completed these mm. cadences, or you had these meetings and these words were said in those meetings, that's all data that then I can correlate to a very interesting set of data, which is outcomes in the CRM, right? Typically stored in a CRM, which is a big database for sales, not yep. workflow, but a big database. And we can say, when you take these kinds of actions, you get to a positive result, closed deal, bigger deal, et cetera. When you take these kinds of actions, you have a very long sales cycle that often doesn't close. And so it's that correlation of, um, of action to outcome, which, I say those words and it sounds it sounds easy, but in the sales world, right, it's like how many stakeholders and what's the process and what are all the activities? So it's a big data model, but you can now start to ask those questions. What are the actions that lead to good outcomes? And now because you have that workflow, that action part in the first part, you can go back and say, we are going to suggest seller that you reach out to the stakeholder because we know you don't have a CISO in the mix and you always need a CISO. Always need a CISO. And, yeah, we're going to tee you up an email we're going to have written that email for you. So all you have to do is kind of do the gut check, maybe add something and go. And so it really is the the interplay between data and action that is so hard. And within both of those, there's a thousand things, but those those are the big ones. Yeah. And, and this is something that we saw quite a bit as relates to as we were applying large language model AI to Atrium, the first step was synthesis, right? Help me make sense of the set of, you know, metrics and kind of like uh, anomaly state associated with this rep or or across these eight reps that I as a manager are responsible for. But again, as, as I like to quote Steve uh, Goldberg always saying, we're not here to admire a problem. Even if the magical AI has said, hey, Pete, uh, Bobby, Bobby really has got a pipe hygiene problem and also an activity problem. And we don't want Pete to be like duly noted, right? We want Pete to like take action on that and say, hey, Bobby, what's up? Um, so, and that's the responsibility of a manager. And so one of the things that then we added was the ability to take action on that in context there. It's like, hey, here's the situation, right? We're not going to like take action directly without like your intervention here. But, you know, if you want to go ahead and coach on this, right? Yeah go ahead and click this and like, oh, the large language model is going to go ahead and write the the coaching communication specifically on this thing about like, hey, notice that, you know, your untouched opportunity count is maybe a little bit higher than we would, we might expect, you know, let's go ahead and talk about that in our next one-on-one. -on -one. In the meantime, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be an awful idea if you just block some time on your calendar to maybe like judge those up, maybe clean some of those out. And so that's the thing is like, you want to take action in that moment because like, we're like, as we're all busy human beings, Right. Yeah. Especially managers. Right. Because like, you know, they're trying to ride along on calls, et cetera, et cetera. So to the extent that like they can take action right there, then that's even better. Right. And I think what and nothing uh, happens without action. Right. Say again. Nothing happens without action. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think one thing that we've heard from our customers quite a bit is this notion of like, you know, obviously the co-pilot like metaphor is, is very helpful. But I like we kind of think of it as like an assistant manager a little yeah. bit. Kind of like, you know, uh, what was the guy's name in the office? Dwight. Right, oh, you yeah. know, assi yeah, assistant, yeah. assistant to the regional, assistant to the regional manager, right? Like a little, uh, little, little Dwight helper there, who uh, instead of being obnoxious like Dwight, is is helpful and potentially can take some action on behalf of yeah. of the manager. Um, obviously, like low risk action, right. right? Which is usually like encouragement or positivity or kind of like coaching, but kind of from a from a standpoint of curiosity. Right, like, hey, notice this thing, right? Oh, are are there kind of like some when you guys are thinking about this automation and orchestration, you know, at what point does it start getting to actual like, you know, direct automation and kind of like execution of because like we've done these things historically, yeah. like, you know, you could do even pre AI, you could do some pretty clever like revenue orchestration things with like lead yep. routing directly into a cadence, you know, starts firing off the cadence with a blessed template, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine a similar thing happening here. Are, are you guys doing anything sort of any stuff around that? Is that kind of future stuff? What do you think? So we ask the question all the time, when do you want a human in the loop? And the answer is different at different times. Now, if you're just, That's as right. you said, sucking in leads and putting them in a cadence, I think we can, you know, we, we, we feel okay about that. Other places where we feel okay is 
hey, read a transcript and tell us if another stakeholder was mentioned. Read a transcript and tell us if a deal risk or a concern or pricing or what have you was mentioned. And we can start to pull that out, synthesize and structure it sometimes into data. And I don't think you need a sales rep in the loop to say, should you pull that out or not? You typically want a way for them to correct it if, if, if it's wrong. Yeah. Um, but we do that, you know, for, for every call we do uh, pull out action items and, and summary and you can edit it if you want, but we don't, we don't make you approve those first. We just give them to you. There are places where I think you want a human in the loop. And so I'll use the example of sending a mail to a prospect, sure. right? We might be able to do 95% of that. We might be able to identify it's the right time, identify it's the right person, queue up the mail, write it for you. And theoretically you could take that action in one second by clicking send, but it should probably take 15 seconds where you just scan it. Maybe you take another 30 and write a personal note, right? So we, we don't, we, we don't want to completely automate the seller because again, we think there's a reason why you have a seller. We right. do want to automate a lot of the work around the seller. And if it is truly just rote work, like we were talking about, like summarizing something, just the seller doesn't want to be in the loop. You don't need them in the loop. When we look at insights, you were, you were talking about this idea of coaching. Um, we're, we're building this, this thing we call the insight engine to complement our, our, our action engine in rhythm. And it's doing these associations of like, hey, these activities lead to these outcomes. And so it'll be able to tell you things like, hey, when you get back to your prospect within a couple hours of them emailing you, you actually typically shorten your sales cycle by 5%. Sure. You know, and that, that might be something that will tell the seller if we have um, if we have insight on their performance, like, hey, we've noticed every time you talk to a, a prospect about pricing, you immediately offer a discount. Like it's a little bit too much. You shouldn't always offer a discount. If we're going to give you that kind of coaching directly to the seller, we'll also let the manager know. Sure. But we won't let the manager know anything the seller doesn't know. We do yeah. think that there's a role for automation there, right? The manager doesn't need to gate that. Maybe they talk about it in a one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe the manager follows up on it. We will send the manager a way to take action as well, like go look at the three last conversations where this happened. Mm -hmm. So everybody can take action, but we don't want to necessarily gate every action on a human. It is a matter of taste. And I'm sure you all see this when you build too. It's absolutely, a, a, it's it's one of the most important questions we ask is when do we need a human in the loop? Yeah, the way that, that I kind of think about it, and and I think again, like revenue operations people have thought about this a lot historically. It's like, it's like where can I automate? And then like, what's the trade-off? And it, there's like a, it's like a risk. It's like, what's the upside in terms of time reduction or or like time reduction or consistency so like yeah. you know actual execution of the thing in question and then that has to be balanced against um risk of right. error right and so as an example um you know one thing i was kind of thinking of is imagine the notion of a um meeting reminder being yeah. sent to the to the prospect um ellie really looking forward to seeing you tomorrow Right. Um, you know, let me know if, uh, if there's anything that's top of mind ahead of time. Right. And then potentially firing that off like, you know, an hour ahead of time as right. well on the same thread. Fairly low risk, fairly right. low risk. Right. Probably something that's good. Right. That, that a, a seller would uh, like you would you would ask a seller to do or like high performing sellers would would engage in that behavior. And so what you would seek to do is like that seems like a something that's like prime for automation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And we've we've done that on the follow up. So now we'll inspect that you had a meeting, whether you recorded it or not in sales off conversations. We'll just look at your calendar and say, hey, we know you met with them. So we're going to cue you that follow up email. We're actually working on that that reminder email. But even more than that, um, we've noticed that sellers really struggle to prep for meetings. So you remind the prospects so that they actually show up. But we're also as part of that flow going to help the seller go into a meeting prep experience where we say, hey, Here's where you're the here's where you are in the opportunity. Here's yep. all the things the customers raised, just like we were talking about before. Don't spend the first 20 minutes of your precious meeting telling them to restate everything. Right? You walk in prepped. Now that meeting prep exercise when we talk to sellers, it's classically something they say, if I had the time, I would prep in this way for every meeting and I'd spend 2 hours prepping for a 1 hour meeting and I'd go through everything, but you know, even that two hours, a lot of it is looking stuff up. 
What if we could give them an experience, a five to 10 to 15 minute prep, right? Maybe they go through it collaboratively if they're in a selling team and yeah. they, they just do it right before the meeting. All the data is there. They're not spending the time pulling the data. They just yeah. prep for that meeting. And those are the kinds of things I think we can automate. Again, you want that seller to have the meeting. The AI is not going to have the meeting, but the yeah. AI can sure help you prep for it. It's so funny that you talk about that because so my, my, my mom is a, is a former uh, grade school teacher and also a professor of education. So I'm a big uh, worksheet fan oh, right that's around, great. around compliance. And so literally what I used, so this is our, um, this is our, our pre-call planning notebook oh, here wow. at Atrium that has a worksheet associated with like, hey, who's this call with? Who are the mm -hmm. stakeholders on this call? Right. Like, oh, did a bunch of people get added to the meeting invite that I didn't really pay attention to? What are their right. titles? Right. Right. Oh, where are we in the deal right now? Right. Yeah. Like where like where, where are things out? What's my like what's the goal of this call? What are the action items that I want to cover? What's the ideal outcome of this? Right. And how do I want to drive to that? What's a potentially bad outcome associated with this? And what am I going to do when the play falls apart? All those sort of things. Right. And so like, that's the sort of, that's a synthesis. Like here's the state of the deal. That's a synthesis action. And then of course, then there's a manipulation and kind of recommendation that ideally the seller is doing. But when you potentially have, you know, junior sellers who, oh man, a CISO got added to this call. What does that mean? How does right. that change? Do do? How does yeah. that change the behavior of, of this call? Right. That can be where like a manager can kind of help out. And so in this case, like, A, even if you're just like, helping kind of prep there. And there's been folks who have tried to do that historically by doing the things that could be available. Like, hey, here are the humans on the call. Here's the titles that we pulled out of like, you know, a variety of yeah. databases or whatever, but that's missing the state, right? That's missing it's deal state. state, right? And what the customer said before. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, exactly. Not, like the, yeah. like all the calls, like the whole bag of words. Right, right? the whole bag of words, right? The customers who are usually talking about this are also concerned about this. Customers who are buying this product are also often interested in this product. There's so much you can do to help help that seller. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So we talked about, about this like notion of synthesis and recommendation. There's different parts of where that can happen in the sales motion. Um, like the power of being able to look across yeah. more of that journey, right? So like starting to capture more and more of that state to go into the synthesis you know, further up the funnel, if you will. I guess I'm doing a, I'm doing like a Jocko bow tie here, as opposed to yeah. further up the funnel, further up the funnel, further, further to the left on the bow tie on Jocko's bow tie. Um, but so that's that's great, and I think there's probably a lot of there's a lot of product to be built in order to exploit Absolutely. and like leverage that additional data right now to like unify the that that database and or it's like the actions that are happening in that database and kind of provide um, you know good jobs to be done for the for the sellers. What, kind of pivoting ahead and like looking even kind of further afield, if you will, because obviously there's a lot of like wood yeah. to chop just on like what you guys did, but like you know what are the kind of future things that that you guys are thinking about ahead of just this like you know the, the stuff that we were talking about just now yeah absolutely and we're, we're actively working on a lot of that and have shipped a bunch of it as well you know it's so interesting when you look at revenue teams op operate because you typically get people who have done it before and something worked but they don't know why and there's some they're great revenue leaders out there. I, I always believe that you know people. I think in like I think like SaaS entrepreneurs could <laughs> you could describe that as this well. Work last time. Oh yeah, what I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, and, and I think people do build intuition, and you see you do see that in great sellers and great leaders. And look, I, I think um, I think they are some of the smartest people out there. They have been underserved by by the ability to inspect the system. And I, I um, you know, I. I live in the world of product and engineering, so I think about observability of the system, right? Like, how does Netflix right. put out such a big, a big um, recommendation system and movie system, and it's it's redundant. It does all these things because they can inspect the system and know it's working. Sales has never had that, yeah. and so you can say, "Hey, we launched this enablement, and then our sales went up, but also the market got better, and our sales team team changed a bit, so we don't really know." But if you can start to observe the system in a deeper way and create some of those associations and observe things like, hey, we told all our sellers to follow up within three hours and things got better, but we actually don't even know if they followed up within three hours or if they used that enablement or the new pitch that we sent them, right? So you can start to say, hey, they were using the enablement and sales got better 
in those places where they used it, right? Now you've got observability of that. You could say that enablement is effective. You could say not one seller has used that talk track, never mind that that PowerPoint or something, that talk track. No, not one seller has mentioned our new product, say, or our new initiative or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not one seller has done this kind of cross sell. But those revenues are going up. So if we know it's not become because of the talk track, it's because of something right. else. And when you can actually observe activities and outcomes in a sophisticated way across a revenue team, you can start to get to that orchestration, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're like, hey, we're going to roll out this enablement because we know it's working. We are going to look at that kind of, uh, we're going to look at this kind of motion because we can see this motion leads to better outcomes. We're going to tune this motion. And by tuning the motion or rolling out a new motion, we're not having to email every seller and say, hey, sellers, now guess what? We're doing this. You just fold it into their workflow. So it comes up for them as an action. And you take so much cognitive load off of the sellers so they can do their job. You give RevOps so many more tools to understand what's actually happening in the system. Now you're actually orchestrating revenue like a system as opposed to hoping and guessing about what's happening. And that is absolutely where we're going. Well, it's my, it's been my understanding that when things get better, it's everyone's, re- like everybody is is responsible for that, right? At least right. if you read like LinkedIn resumes, right? That's, That's right. like, That's what is right. six, success has many parents, but uh, but failure is an orphan. So right. uh, yeah, so in this case, we can kind of actually figure out the, the root cause. Well, look at this enablement program that happened. Yeah, actually, nobody actually uh, adopted that whatsoever. Right. It just turns out that Jerome Powell lowered interest rates and people started buying software again. Um, right. So I love we should them a fruit basket. <laughs> I loved your 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 fox in the back and kind of your persona of 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 how you think of Atrium. We we think about that the same with Salesloft. Um, different kind of persona. I always I always imagine the the grizzled seller in the corner back in the old you know like in the in person days. We don't want Salesloft to be kind of a um, uh, an obnoxious smart person who's just telling you all the things you're doing wrong, right? We want right. we want Salesloft to be the persona I always think of is that person. They know their craft. They are good. You know the yeah. seller, like somebody who just knows what they're doing upside down. Maybe they've been in 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 role for a long time. Maybe they're a manager or a leader, but it's that person kind of sitting next to you, saying, "You know what? You you know what you should really do right now. When you see that, this is what's going on, and you should do that." It's it's coaching, but it's doing it at scale in a thoughtful and intelligent way, and in a way that helps the team not tries to say, you know, you, you know, not, not tries to treat them like robots. Yeah, totally. And I think this has been something like, cause we've been on our, our journey around kind of like helping non-analytical, less technical um, sellers and sales leaders make use of data and metrics in order to manage performance and, and um, you know, more effectively. And I think there's kind of two big things that we've learned over the last bit that have kind of like, that like, boy, howdy, I wish I had learned them like four years ago, as opposed to like two years ago. And I think it kind of comes down to, I mean, I guess the root cause of all of it is that people are people, yeah. the first thing, right? And then as a result, so people, like they make sense um, of, of the world using words. And, mm-hmm. and kind of like narrative that that's how they that's how they understand things right and that's actually really important for sellers because sellers use their words to extract information and change the worldview of their prospects so that's the first thing and so if you're going to be managing someone right or giving them data or what have you you have to do it with the words and then the second thing is that people are also they have feelings right they they have limbic systems and so if you show up and, you, and like this is actually really important as a manager if you show up and come off the top rope right? Yeah. How are they gonna? How are they gonna react? Right? Like this is kind of we we're talking yeah. about observability. You're doing this, 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 and this wrong. It's terrible. It's all terrible. Like that's that's awful. Right. So like you, yeah. one of the things that people often talk about is the concept of observability as it relates to like Datadog or New Relic mm-hmm. or whatever. Guess what? The server doesn't get hurt feelings if you tell it that it has a slow query. Doesn't right. care. Right. Doesn't care. Whereas like a seller, right, or even a manager does. And so you know when when kind of like delivering that information. And I think leaders know that, like leaders who have been around the block and then also RevOps people who have been around the block, like um, have realized that what they need to do is they need to wrap their insights and their recommendations in ways that are going to be effective for to the audience, which is actually a sales insight, 
right? Because sure. like you don't just show up and say like, you know, hi, Mr. Prospect, hi, Ms. Prospect, this is why you're broken, et cetera, et cetera. We approach that with like, you know, soft words yeah. that like lead them to that realization. And I think that's actually a really important thing. So instead of showing up and saying like, hi, you're dumb for these reasons right here, we need to approach it from the standpoint of like, hey, Ellie, I noticed this thing right here. And, you know, I might be off on this front, but like, you know, would, yeah. would it be a terrible idea if X, Y, Z? Right? right. And I think that the more you can do that, the more effective, like, you know, adoption is going to be, which will then try action totally. and, and bow puts. And I, I think it, that this is a great observation about people and, and how you approach it. I think prioritization comes in there too, because sure. once you start looking at data, you could probably come up with a thousand things, aggregate, mm -hmm. analytics, what have you. We're trying to hold a bar where an insight is something significant enough where taking an action will change the outcome. Right. And so we don't want to tell you 50 things about the call you just did, because every human is going to be like, oh, my God, I can't I can't deal with those 50 things. We want to tell you one or two things about the last 10 calls you had and really keep the bar high so that when you get that coaching, that storytelling, you're like, oh, yeah, OK, well, I can see why you say that. I can see what outcome you're trying to drive. And I think I could probably work on that. That's right. Exactly. It's just like it's all sales, right? It's all persuasion. Yeah. Right? You know, the the revelation of an of a potential problem, then and the like the recognition of that, the internalization of that, and then like a recommendation of a of a potential action. Um, well, this is super awesome. You guys are obviously doing a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, I think that As probably in the, Love what you in, guys the next, in the in that in the next six to twelve months, I think a bunch of kind of cool stuff is going to be coming out of. Uh, you know, uh, the sales loft HQ there, the distributed sales loft HQ. So I'm really looking forward to kind of keeping my eye on that. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Ellie, thank you for joining us. You know, it's not a, typically we have, you know, sales leaders from various companies in our community and, and what have you. So it's, you know, really awesome to have a product leader who serves those folks kind of sharing what, what she has heard from the market and what, what you guys are doing to serve the market. So thanks very much. And everyone, um, Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, stick around for the next session here with the Modern Sales uh, Pros Sales Excellence Summit. And Ellie, you have a great rest of your day, okay? You too, Pete.